Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Y'all look beautiful out there today in the house of God. You may be seated. Thankful to be here today. It's already been a great day. Amen. And I'm determined that it's going to continue to be a great day, regardless of what happens and what comes our way, right? Because a lot of times, we are the one that determines the outcome of the situation. We determine what the situation is. And I was in a Bible study this morning, we were talking about how so many different things happen. And a lot of times, the Bible says that God, in Hebrews, is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he, he writes your faith through different situations and circumstances. And, and he's the one that finishes it. He seals your faith in the end of it all. And a lot of times we look at the one situation that occurred. You know, I, 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 I rolled my ankle, right? But we miss everything that happened around it. And if we stop and we, we look back, we'll realize that, hey, you know, that, that guy that called my name right before I rolled my ankle, if, if I didn't look back when he called my name, I would have fell in the hole and landed on my head, right? The situation would be different. And a lot of times, especially in the hard times, you have to look for the hand of God in it. It's not always evident. But if you could stop, the Bible says meditate on the word of God. If you stop and meditate and, and you think back on the events leading up to where you are today, you can look back and say, you know what? God's been with me through all of this. He's been there through it all. I haven't, I haven't seen it. But you're here in the house of God today, not because of the decision that you made this morning, but because of five years ago, something happened that led you along this path. And God has been steering you, been guiding you. And as long as you remain righteous, then the word of God applies to you where it says, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So if you're here today, then you realize that God is ordering your steps. And he's trying to build and increase your faith, and he's doing that through the different things that we go through day by day. Amen? Because that's how we grow in the house of God. And so I'm glad to be here, amen. I'm glad that you made it to the house of God. And more importantly, I'm glad to know that God is going to manifest himself. He's already manifesting his presence in this place here today. Amen? And so I acknowledge that. And I want each and every one of us to acknowledge this. And as we go through the Sunday school lesson here today, amen, we want to make sure that we give God the praises that is due unto him. That song that says, I'll praise you in the storm, and I will lift my hands, for you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I cry, you hold in your hands. That's Bible. In the book of Revelation, an angel comes before God, bearing with him a vial, and in it is the prayer and the tears of the saints. Every tear you cry, everything that you go through, one day is going to come up, the Bible says, as a memorial, a, a method of memory before God. Amen? So don't think you're wasting your time. Amen? Because like the Sunday school lesson said, you were made for a purpose. If we could stand in the house of God tonight, or this, this afternoon, this morning, today, can't go wrong with today, right? That applies all day long. The Sunday, the Sunday school lesson is titled, Made for a Promise. Turn your Bibles, if you could, to the book of Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 4 through verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through verse 9. And, and I'm going to let you in on a secret. More often than not, I'm deliberate with which verses I allow you all to read if you all haven't picked up on it yet. So while you're reading, pay attention to the words that you're saying. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 4, or correction, chapter 1, verse 4 through 9. If you find it, say praise the Lord. If you haven't found it yet, then look up for redemption draws nigh. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 9. Verse 4 says this. I'll start. You'll read verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 5. lost my place. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I want that to resonate for a little bit. Could we, could we read that, that last verse again? 
after, after, after you were born, that's when God learned about you, right? It's only after you were born and you became an adult and then you recognize him. That, at that point is when God actually starts to recognize you, right? That's when God found, oh, man, look, there's this guy named Vincent Price. Wow. Hey. Right? That's when God knew you, right? Can we read that verse again? Verse 6 says this, then said I, Jeremiah, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Verse 7, please. Be not afraid of their faces, outward appearance, for I am with thee. To deliver thee, saith the Lord. Verse 9. Amen. You may be seated. Y'all could take verse 5, 7, and 9. All the verses that y'all read. I didn't read them. Y'all read them. And read each of those verses to yourself. Every time the devil tries to lie to you, tries to tear you down, try to make you believe that you're less than what God sees you as you read those verses because this is what God is saying to us. It doesn't just apply to Jeremiah. He wasn't just saying to Jeremiah before you were born, I knew you. He was saying it as a memorial for all of us here today. Before you walk through the door... Be I could go way back, and I'm not going to go way back, amen. But before you were born, God already knew you. There's nothing that you could possibly do that is going to catch the almighty God by surprise, amen. But along or, or aside from knowing you, God created you for a purpose, for a reason. Amen? And the focus verse for today's lesson is, is Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 where, where y'all read this morning, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Before you were born, God knew you. And your sanctification, even though it may not occur that day like it did with Jeremiah, it was promised for you one day. And that applies because the Bible calls Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. So when God said, let there be light, it wasn't at that point that Jesus was crucified. And so here the Bible is saying that I sanctified you from your birth. It's not saying that the moment you were born, you were sanctified. But he's saying, I have sanctification laid out for you from the moment you were born. You may walk around without purpose, but God has a purpose for you. Amen? And that's why there's an innate desire in every last one of us to find out, man, what's my purpose? And you go to, what's his name, Tim Rollins, and say, Tim Rollins, I need to know my purpose. And Tim Rollins is going to tell you some good stuff, but he don't know your purpose. He's going to tell you to do certain things that will help you probably find your purpose. But the one that created you is the only one that knows full and well what your purpose is. Amen? The focus thought for the lesson is this. I will serve God faithfully. Honoring the purpose for which he created me. Challenge in the church. It's a challenge in church to fulfill the purpose that God created you for because you have mentors and you have people that you can look up to in the church, right? But you've got to recognize that as they are an example or should be an example of holiness, right, they are not God's purpose for you, right? Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say here today is 
Don't think, and I know nobody's trying to do this and I'm not putting myself up, but don't think living like how I live and doing the things that I do is God's purpose for you. That is going to frustrate your purpose. It's going to frustrate you living for God. Because you're, you weren't created, and you maybe, I don't know, but you weren't created, work with me here, you weren't created to play the drums, right? To run a sound system and then to teach a Sunday school lesson. Those are things that I, I'm doing here. But so, so if you say, I am going to do exactly what he's doing, you, won't, you will miss God's purpose for you. People are set about you to encourage you and to help you, but they're not set about you so you can try to be them. Right? You have got to figure out, God, what have you called me to do? What have you called me? Who have you called me to be? Because here's the thing. You may be an intercessory prayer warrior like I can't even touch. Amen. I, I get down and I'm finding a, a, a hard time trying to find that prayer closet. Amen. I was like, I thought it was upstairs. I thought it was downstairs. But you, you may be able to just wherever you are, just set aside and immediately you're, you're tapped into the spirit and the anointing of God and you're feeling, this is intercession, you're feeling how Sister Hicks is feeling like you are her and you're able to go before God and say, God, please touch my sister. This really hurts and, and you could truly intercede like I can't. But if you try to be me, then you can't fulfill the purpose that God has set aside for you. And you can't contribute to the church like how God wants you to contribute to the church. You were made for a purpose. God knows that purpose. There's a little soapbox that I want to jump on here, and this is maybe an internal thing, but for many years, scholars have called the book of Jeremiah the weeping prophet, right? That's what they call him, the weeping prophet. It's not biblical. The Bible doesn't say he's the weeping prophet because every last one of them cried. Isaiah, Hosea, Jeremiah, I mean, Lamentations, he cries a lot, but, I mean, he laments for the people of Israel. But in the book of Jeremiah, there's, there's a couple of verses, and Brother Josh, this is what I was, I was talking about. There's a couple of verses in the book of Jeremiah that if you just consider Jeremiah the weeping prophet, you'll miss a lot of things that Jeremiah said to the people of God that, that is essential, and it has nothing to do with weeping. But here's the problem. If you go into this book thinking he's the weeping prophet, that sets your mindset for what you are going to pick up on. Amen. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Of God, not of Jeremiah. So how God uses Jeremiah does not, nece does not necessarily dictate the message that God wants to give you. Right? Okay, I say all of that to say this. You, you probably want to stop calling him the weeping prophet. All right? Because every last one of us is the weeping prophet. Anybody ain't never cried before? But with the weeping comes verses like these. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Brother Josh, first one on the list. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified thee. God knows you. Next verse, Brother Josh, next one on the list. 29 verse 13. A promise from God to you and I. And ye shall seek me. And find me, watch, when, God, I can't find you because your heart's not in it. Because if your heart is in it and you're not finding him, then this verse is a lie. So either God's a lie or you're missing the mark, buddy. So we've got to look ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, it is not God, it's me. I can't find him because my heart is with Tyrone or Johnny or Jesse or Jenny or whatever or Pizza Hut. But I can't find him because my heart is with not him, but something else. But what I read in Jeremiah says, ye shall seek me, you're looking for me, you're going to find me. It's a promise. It is, it is set in stone when you search for me with all your heart. Next verse. And I will give you pastors as he walks through the door, according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. God promises to do that to you. So if you ain't got a pastor, then hey, you, it's not God's fault. You need to go out and find one. Do I wish to confirm or, or, or convince man or God? God doesn't need my convincing. I can't convince him. His word needs to convince you. 
that we need pastors in our life. And, and, and God, this is, he says, Jesus says, I will. Not that I might. Not if it feels good to me, but he says, I will give you, right? That's a promise. And the promises of God are yea and amen, right? Next verse. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. Here's my point with this verse. For I am married unto you. When somebody leaves the church and you turn your back on them, you are doing something that God himself is not doing. Because God is married unto them. He's married to me when I, and listen, we think, oh, Lord, help me. Okay, I'm going to go as fast as I can. But we think that backsliding is leaving. Uh-uh. You could sit there and be backslidden. Because it's a heart thing. When you search for me with your whole heart. So you could be here in body but not here in mind. And definitely not here in spirit. And But realize that even in that situation where I can't see it, God sees it. But he still is looking at you as I am married to you. You are my bride. But then he says, turn. Right? Come on back, baby. Was that inappropriate? I don't know. I hope it wasn't. If it was, forgive me. Amen. But God's saying, come on back. I'm married to you. Still talking about our purpose here. Next verse, Brother Josh. The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, yea, I have loved thee with a conditional love. This is just a weeping prophet, so you don't know nothing about that. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore... With loving kindness have I pushed you away. Is that what it says? This is God's word. Straight from the mouth of God himself. Right? Come on. These verses, you write these down, you say them to yourself every day if you got to. When the world tells you that God's going to give up on you, you look that fool in the face. The Bible says you, you could call him a fool. He says, oh, you foolish Galatians. Well, who has bewitched you, right? You look that fool in the, place, in the face and say, hey, you are saying that God is going to do something that God said he's not going to do. He said he loves me with an everlasting love. You got a conditional love towards me based on what I do for you. But the God that I serve loves me regardless of what I do for me. Why? Because in this word, he says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Right? Next verse, Brother Josh, I think we're coming to the end. That, that, that was the last verse, right? That was the last verse. Go back. So those verses in the weeping prophet, if you look at the book of Jeremiah as just written by a weeping prophet, you preface and you, you prime your mind to only see the weeping things, right? But realize that Jeremiah is just simply the prophet of God, speaking the words of God. And in those words, there's going to be... There's going to be chastisement, there's going to be correction, but there's going to be a whole lot of love. Because the Bible tells you to preach the truth in what? Love. Right? God's going to do what he's telling you to do. Amen? So made for a purpose. Now we get to go into the Sunday school lesson. That was my soapbox on the weeping prophet. Amen? In the Sunday school lesson today, it talks about you being made for a purpose. And I'm going to start this lesson off from the back end. Amen? It starts with us, it's, 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 it's talking about a story that says, the story is told of a man walking past a construction site who, growing curious about the nature of the project, approached one of the workers, a bricklayer, and asked, Sir, I was wondering, could you tell me what you're doing here? The worker glared up at the passerby and with a shorter voice growled, Well, isn't it obvious I'm laying bricks? Rebuffed, the pedestrian approached another man further down the block with the same exact question. With tired eyes, the second worker says, oh, me? I'm just building a wall. Finally, the man approached a third worker with this inquiry and was shocked by the bright smile and the enthusiastic, enthusiastic answer. The worker said, well, isn't it obvious? I am building a cathedral. The most important thing to notice is that all three workers were doing exactly the same task, the same exact thing. Even though they had the same occupation, only one had a real sense of what he was doing. 
an understanding of his work as an act of devotion to the Lord that would have lasting significance. Brother Asado talked about having the why with God on Thursday night. When you don't know why you're here and what your purpose is, you're going to come into the house of God and you're going to do all sorts of crazy stuff. And you're going to miss the mark. But when you know why you are here, why God created you, then you will see every day through a different point of view. And that is what we have to develop because if you don't develop that point of view that God made you, I'm going to just give you the answer straight up because I'm running out of time. God made you for true relationship with him. He didn't make you for a fake relationship with him that is based on being in the house of God. What do you mean, Brother Price? Well, when I'm at church, the Lord is blessing me. He's keeping me. But when I'm at the house, I'm like, God has forsaken me. I don't even know why I was up with him. He, God didn't make you for that. He made you for a real relationship that, yeah, you know what, God, I'm hurting right now at home. And when you go to church, God, I'm hurting right now. I need you, amen. He wants you to be pure before him and honest. Don't worry about creating a front for the people who can't do nothing for you. But be open and honest before God. He wants a true and real, real is the, uh, I'm telling you, real is the important word here today, real relationship with you. The Bible talks about, or the lesson talks about in the Garden of Eden. I'm just going to give you the overview here for the sake of time. But in the Garden of Eden, God made Adam. From Adam, God made Eve, right? And in the midst of all that, the reason why he did that, the Bible says that in the cool of the evening, God would come down and he would walk and he would commune with Adam and Eve, right? That act that God did with his creation is the same act that God wants to continue to do with his creation. Overview I'm giving you here. The Bible says that sin separates us from God. Amen. It says righteousness cannot inherit the kingdom. Unrighteousness, my apologies, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So because of sin, we became unrighteous. And so because of that, it caused a separation between us and God. So that relationship that God had in the Garden of Eden, he cannot, because he's a holy God, right? He's a righteous God. He's not holy like we're holy, right? We're holy and we're drinking that holy wine because I blessed it, right? We, we're drinking that holy beer because I drank it and we're smoking that holy cigarette because I thank God for it. He's not holy like that. The holy, he is separated. He is holy. He says, be thou holy for I am holy. Because he's a holy God. He cannot intermingle with sin. And so the Bible, that creates a problem for you and I because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were born in sin and sin were reborn and that's what our mother conceived us in, right? Because of things outside of our control. But in spite of all of that, God made a way to bridge the gap. Calvary. Amen. He endured the cross, the Bible says, despising the shame. Jesus, about, and I was reading it this morning, amen, the Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy that was set before him is you and I being reunited in communion with him. You're created for the purpose of relationship. And here on earth, it's easy to get sidetracked because physical relationship appears greater than spiritual. I can't really demonstrate the inner of inners here, but spiritual relationship. It's easy for me to facilitate a physical relationship. Ooh, girl, you so pretty. Oh, stop that. As opposed to a spiritual relationship. We are saying, I'm a broken, contrite person, full of sin, full of sin. But God, you're a holy and righteous God. And I know by the book of Jeremiah that when I backslid, you, were still, you still were married to me and you wanted me to turn around. So God, I'm turning around. I'm here. 
Amen. And I know from Jeremiah that you love me with an everlasting love. So I'm coming. And, and you said in Jeremiah, if I search with my whole heart, then I'm going to find you. So God, I'm giving you my whole heart here today. Not just a part of me. Not just the part that makes passes. God say, oh, look, he's getting after it. But I'm giving you the part that he can't see. I'm just broken on the inside. And when you do that, that opens up the door for you to get back into what God made you for. That true relationship with him. Amen. The lesson talks about our relationship with God. The lesson also talks about our being used by God. Amen. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to hit some of these points here today. It says, as with Jeremiah, our divine calling is founded upon and rooted with, rooted in our relationship with God. I already said that. It says, God does not offer to be in a relationship with us because we can do things for him. Rather, God, by his grace, enters into a relationship with us, and then he enables us to work for him. And that's why the devil wants to stop you. Because if I could stop you from getting into a relationship with God, I don't have to worry about you working for God. It's a process. Obeying the gospel leads you into a relationship with God. Repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the washing away of your sins, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, that's the gospel Paul preached. That enables you to go into a relationship with God, right? And then after that, then God can use you. Then God will use you, and then God will equip you, but you have to enter into a relationship with him first. The story of Jeremiah's calling challenges us to disabuse ourselves of a perversive, no, pervasive notion related to God's calling. Our assumption that we will always automatically do, like to do, everything God has called us to do. The truth is the call of God often leads us down paths we would rather not walk. And this is why Paul chose the language of presenting your bodies a living sacrifice to describe the, 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 the Christian relationship in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. After you get in a relationship with God, the life that you live for God is not going to be easy. But here's the news flash: It wasn't going to be easy anyway. You got to blame somebody and something so it's just easier to say, man, things were going good until I started going to church. No, dude, you had that DUI before you even set foot in the church. You were a drunk before you even thought about church. Before you thought about God, you already had the divorce. So no, things weren't going good before you came to church. You were just blinded by because you loved the sin that you were in. But now, when you come on this side of God, the Bible says that your heart is going to be turned away from your sin. You're not going to like it anymore. It's not going to please you anymore. And that is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable. And it's not going to be pleasant, but that process is necessary. God said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans chapter 12, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Ready for this? Holy. First one. And then after you hit holy up and acceptable unto God, and that's your reasonable service. You don't want to hit holy? <laughs> Forget about it. You don't want to hit acceptable with God? Forget about it. I will tell you, and there's a lot of religions out there that will tell you, yeah, just keep paying that tithe, girl. You'll be good. Heaven's waiting for you, right? Just keep, keep, keep playing the piano for me. You'll be good. Keep playing the drums for me. You'll be good. But that's not what God is saying. God said, I beseech you, I beg of you to present your is this flesh, you yourself, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. What is my purpose? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Your purpose is to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, because that's the least you can do, your reasonable service. Right? The equivalent of your reasonable service is actually paying the taxi driver for dropping off. That's what you're supposed to do, right? He brings you somewhere. You pay him. 
So why is it when it comes to living for God, he brings you somewhere and you want to ditch and dine? Right? Y'all know what ditch and dining is, right? Get that food and when the check comes, you go. Y'all, y'all never heard about that before? We want to ditch and dine with God. God, take me out of this problem. Make my life better here on earth. And then I'm going to ditch you. Fix this problem for me, God. If you're real and you love me, do this for me. He does it, and then you forget about him. Ditch and dine. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is relationship. And a relationship that is holy and acceptable. Not before me. I can't do nothing for you, but before God. That's your reasonable service. Winding down here, a key tenet of the Protestant Reformation was the call of God that was, of, I'm sorry, a key calling or a key tenet of the Protestant Reformation was that the call of God was not something only experienced by a select elite few, such as the priests, the monks, and the nuns, but was something experienced by all believers no matter their life's work. Any honest occupation could be considered a God-ordained vocation. There are pastors, there's a five-fold ministry. Evangelists, teachers, preachers, pastors, there, there's a five-fold ministry. But the lesson here is talking about that what you do on a day-to-day basis at work is also your ministry. Amen? It is pointless for you to live like a hobo at work, right, doing everything you want, sleeping everywhere you want, walking and speaking every other way you want to, and then come to church and then say, you know, it, it's pointless for you to do that because if your coworker comes to church and they see you up here praising God, they're going to be like, oh, I need to turn around and be on up out of here. I need to go. The point, the Bible says that your life is a living epistle to be read of all men, right? You a book. And guess what? Whether you like it or not, people are reading your book. They're reading your story. They're reading your story and your story is telling them what or how you feel about your God. Are you going to mess up? Of course you are. But your story can either say Vince messed up. Or your story can say like what God's story says, a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. So your story can be like, I messed up, and then, you know, I'm just going to go all out. Or your story can be like, I messed up, but the Bible says God commands a man everywhere to repent. So your story could say, Vince messed up, but then he did what the Bible tells him to do. He repented. Wow. So I could do that. Right? Your life is a living story. And what you do is going to minister more than what you say. That's why we like cartoons. That's why we like movies. We're not reading people anymore. We're watching them now. This is HBO, home box office. A lot of people know what HBO stands for, right? Home box office. Your life at work needs to reflect that you know what your purpose is. Your life at home needs to reflect that you know what your purpose is. Right here, right now, you have got to know what your purpose is. God brought you here first and foremost to be in a relationship with him. And then after you have decided that you're going to do that, you got to present yourself a living sacrifice unto him, holy, and it's got to be holy. And it's got to be acceptable before him. Amen? Because that's the least that you could do, your reasonable service. The idea that service to God should only have done, and if we could all stand here, the idea that the service of God should have only to do with a church altar, singing, reading, sacrifice, and the like, is without doubt the worst trick of the devil. This is written by Martin Luther. Amen? Not, I have a dream, Martin Luther, but Protestant Reformation Martin Luther, right? There's more than one. All right? Martin Luther... And I'm not going to go into the whole Protestant Reformation. But Martin Luther wrote, the idea that service to God should have only do with the altar singing, reading, and sacrifice, and the like, is without doubt the worst trick of the devil. He came out of the Catholic religion. Amen? 
He says, how could the devil have led us more effectively astray than by the narrow conception that service to God takes place only in church and by the works that are done therein. That's a false notion. The whole world could abandon with service to the Lord, not only in church, but also in the home, kitchen, workshop, fields, etc. You come here to learn of God, to learn the things of God, but you go out there to put what you have learned into action, right? The life that you live in every day, it needs to reflect that you know what your purpose is. You're here today because God wants to give you purpose, a deeper purpose and a deeper understanding. But it is for you to allow him to do that. And like Jeremiah said, if your whole heart is not into it, you are not going to find him. You're not going to find him. But the moment you get your heart into it, he's there, waiting, arms wide open. Amen? We're going to pray. We're going to go through the rest of the service here today. I want to encourage everybody in the house here. The song service is going to go about. I don't know what songs they have lined up. The preaching is going to come about. I don't know what pastor has lined up to preach. But I want to encourage everybody in this house here today to make up in your mind that you know that you are here because God, as you read it earlier, God drew you here. He drew you here. And because he drew you here, he loves you, we read it earlier, with an everlasting love. And because he loves you with an everlasting love, he desires to change your life. He desires to be found of you. And so now you have got to determine, God... I'm going to find you today. I'm going to give my whole heart to you today, not just a part, because that's your part to do, and God will do the rest. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you, Jesus for your, your anointing in this house. I thank you, mighty God, for your words of encouragement. I thank you, Lord God, for the direction, Lord Jesus, for the church, for, for each and every one of us in this place here today. I thank you, Jesus, because before we were even born, mighty God, before, before you, the Bible says, formed us in the womb of our parents, you knew us, mighty God. So there's nothing that we have done, Lord God, that is a surprise to you. So I pray here today, Jesus, that every man, every woman, every child will be able, Lord God, to lay aside the self-condemnation, to lay aside the doubt and the fear, and to realize that, God, you know us better than we know ourselves, and that we can boldly approach the throne of grace here today, Jesus, and ask you to forgive us of our sins. Ask you, Lord God, to cleanse our heart, to cleanse our minds, to cleanse our vessel, Jesus, that we can live, Lord God, a life that is holy and acceptable before you, mighty God. Anoint the service, Lord God, and Jesus, inhabit the praises of your people in this house as we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In your mighty name we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus.